Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, I'm Nicholas Gordon, host of the Asian Review of Books podcast done in partnership with the New Books Network. In this podcast, we interview fiction and nonfiction authors working in, around, and about the Asia-Pacific region. In 330 BC, Alexander the Great conquers the city of Persopolis, the ceremonial capital of the Persian Empire. His troops later burn it to the ground, capping centuries of tensions between the Hellenistic Greeks and Macedonians and the Persians. That event kicks off Rachel Kauser's book, Alexander at the End of the World, The Forgotten Final Years of Alexander the Great, which tells the story of how Alexander, the unbeaten military genius and most powerful man in that part of the world, decided to keep going, chasing rebellious ex-Persians and launching an unprecedented invasion of India. But what drove Alexander to keep marching? What was the kind of empire Alexander wanted to build? And why did he eventually turn back at the Indus River, his soldiers begging for him to return home? Rachel Kauser is the chair of the class department at the Graduate Center, City University of New York, and a professor of ancient art and tech archaeology at Brooklyn College. She is also the author of The Afterlives of Greek Sculpture, Interaction, Transformation, Destruction, and Hellenistic and Roman Ideal Sculpture, The Allure of the Classical. So, Rachel, thank you so much for coming on the show today to talk about Alexander the Great. Your book doesn't cover all of Alexander's history. It starts with the burning of, of Persopolis. Why did you decide to start your narrative there? Thank you. Uh, there are a couple of reasons why the burning of Persepolis is so important. One is that it's a real turning point for Alexander. So he... I think at this point in his career, and we can talk more about that later, everyone's sort of expecting him to cash in and go home. Instead, he burns down this great royal city and keeps going east. And that's an important decision that he deals with the repercussions for the rest of his, um, his life, his short and violent life. Uh, The other reason is that I wanted to show two sides of Alexander with this action. One is his incredible capacity for destructiveness, which I don't want to underrate. It's not always the focus of what I'm talking about. I think there's a lot more to him than this sort of swashbuckling, pillaging jerk that a lot of people see him as. But I I don't want to sugarcoat him either. And the burning of Persepolis, the wanton destruction of this huge town with a great history is is a good example. At the same time, I think it also showcases his ability to work in a way that communicates effectively to his Persian subjects. The Greeks tend to think of the burning of Persepolis as vengeance for the destruction of many cities in such as Athens 150 years earlier when the Persians invaded. I think Alexander was looking much more to a Persian audience uh, and showing them through this, your king cannot uh, protect you. I'm in charge now. Further resistance is futile, which I must say, it was not a nice way of doing it, but he got that message across. So, so where are we in terms of, in terms of the story here? You know, so like, What's happened before he he burns Persopolis to the ground? Yeah, so Alexander, at the time when he burns Persepolis, he's this young, implausibly successful king who has, over the past three years, created what is the first European empire in the Middle East. And he is... You know, everyone's kind of expecting him to go home. Instead, he keeps going east toward what is really the other half of the Persian Empire. The Greeks see this as kind of the end of the world. Persepolis is as far as they can possibly imagine from Greece. But it's really only about halfway through the Persian Empire. Alexander sees this, and he keeps going through what turns out to be this kind of epic wild ride. So when we when we're talking about Alexander's life, what are the actual sources that we're referring to? I mean, I assume there's not a lot of written evidence. So what what is there um, when we're writing about Alexander's life? 
The funny thing about Alexander is he's like JFK. So everyone who was involved with him wrote a memoir. His great general Ptolemy wrote a memoir. One of his engineers, a guy named Aristobulus, wrote a memoir. He had an official historian, a guy named Callisthenes, whose death he later causes. Um, even his dream interpreter, and yes, that's a real position in the Macedonian army, this guy writes a memoir about Alexander's dream. So there was originally a lot of information. None of those sources are preserved in their entirety now. And instead, the earliest sources that we have that talk about Alexander are, apart from a few sort of inscriptions in fourth century bureaucraties, are really 300 years after Alexander. So it's as if you're writing a biography of George Washington with no written sources earlier than now. And that makes these sources, you know, very late. Um, and I would say they're also rather biased in that they're looking at Alexander always from this Greco-Roman perspective and never from a Persian one. Yeah, there's so, like there's like a lot of commentary that talks about how he's like descending into Oriental despotism and things like that, right? Oh, yeah. Yes, you've picked up on one of the things that I find most frustrating, both in the sources, the ancient literary sources themselves, and honestly, in a certain amount of modern commentary as well. It feels very heart of darkness to me. Uh, and so one of the things I've done, because I'm an archaeologist, is to integrate these written sources. So I take I take them. They're, they're useful. They give us their, the only sort of chronological narrative we have, but I'm really trying to put them together with um, material culture, so things like the ashes of Persepolis, and also with the tremendous amount that we now know about the Persian Empire from the Persians. So there's been a real renaissance of Persian studies in the last 25 years, and a lot more has been translated, which gives us a much better sense of the Persian Empire and the way it worked and how powerful and effective it was. And I think that gives us, therefore, a greater sense of what Alexander is doing and why it's so impressive. Mm -hmm. And also something about how the conquest was experienced by the conquered. Mm -hmm. So the first thing Alexander does after burning for the ground is chase after Darius. What is this military campaign like? Right. So just to back up briefly, he's defeated Darius at a series of major battles, most recently at one in what's called Gagamela in 331 BCE. And But Darius escapes, he flees the battlefield, and he heads east. And Alexander does not immediately follow him. Instead, he sort of does a mopping up expedition where he make sure to secure the major capital cities of Babylon, Susa, Persepolis. So he's really locking, locking into the treasuries and the command, the, the most commanding cities. But he knows he's going to have to deal with Darius. And Darius is heading to the eastern part of the empire, which is where he can raise you know, easily another huge army. Uh, and in fact, that's where the sort of stronghold of the Persian cavalry comes from. And it's a very rich, very powerful part of the empire. So in the summer of 330, Alexander is 25. He is heading east to try and, and find Darius. And he's got an army that's at this point around 30,000 people. But he realizes as he's heading into the mountains of eastern Iran and the deserts of eastern Iran that this is a really desolate landscape and there's no way he can march 30,000 soldiers that way. Plus, what he needs is speed because as he's going east, he's hearing these stories which say, you know, rumors that say like 
Darius has been deposed. Uh, Bessos, who's one of his important, powerful governors from what's now Afghanistan, is in charge. And Alexander's desperate to get to them before anything else happens, because this is clearly a very unstable political situation. And so he sheds soldiers relentlessly so that by the time he gets to where he knows he's close, he's got maybe 3,000, so a tenth of his army. And he's left everybody else with different generals along the way, which is a huge gamble. When you think about it, he knows that he is following on the tracks of a guy who has just been deposed by his own men. And he is leaving his men with what would have been, if they had all collaborated, an army that vastly outnumbered his own. But nonetheless, he takes that risk. He um, gets to the place where he finds the remnants of the Persian army. And Darius is dead. He's been stabbed by uh, Bessus and the other conspirators and left for dead. The literary sources say he was wearing golden chains and stuck in a cart with covered with grimy animal skins. And so Alexander never gets the legitimacy he was hoping for. He wanted Darius to kind of submit to him and say, okay, you're the Persian king now. And instead, Darius is dead and Bessus is heading to Afghanistan, his own sort of center of power, to raise another army against Alexander. And that's really where my book gets going. Yeah, and that leads to a whole more series of campaigns to try and, I guess, solidify control over this area and take down any possible, I guess, any, any remaining challenger for legitimacy. Absolutely. And part of the thing that I thought was so interesting about this, this later part of his, his career, which is usually distri- you know, dismissed as this kind of degenerate aftermath of a once promising reign. Um, and to me, it's like where he has to learn how to think and fight differently. Because instead of doing big formal battles where you've got like his army on one side and this big army of Darius on the other and they fight each other with rules, he's dealing, especially in Afghanistan and Central Asia, with guerrilla fighters who are brilliant at kind of darting in, taking some people out and then vanishing into the desert. And that's a totally different form of warfare. And he's got to figure out what to do about it and how to stabilize this area that had always been a little bit more fluidly connected to the center. Mm -hmm. Um, So before we shift from there to, to the campaign in India, I want to ask a few questions about the army itself. You know, first of all, you know, how was war fought during this time? So, like, what actually was the makeup of Alexander's army? And I know there's differences between the Macedonians and the Greeks and the Persians, but but, but in broad strokes, how did Alexander's mm-hmm. army fight? So, what makes Alexander's army so different and so effective was his ability to combine people from all over the empire and every pers- every group he conquered. He took some some fighting forces from. So by the time he gets to India, for example, he's got archers from India. He's got, they were really good at archery. He's got cavalrymen from Afghanistan because they had the best horses. He's got sailors from Phoenicia and Egypt. Those are the great naval powers at the time. And he's like the commander of this amazing orchestra where he figures out what each of them can do that they do best in order to make his army as a whole more effective. And so he's using, therefore, the modern term would be combined arms tactics, where he's using lots of different things instead of sort of just relying on your basic heavy armed infantry and cavalry, which is what most Macedonian and Greek armies of his time would have been used, uh, used to using. So that's one thing to say. The other thing to say is that battles were really short, and most of what Alexander did is not fight battles. He did four major battles over the course of his tumultuous 12-year reign. Um, And, you know, 
they weren't even a day long. So this is not like World War I where you're sort of slogging through the Somme for, for days on end. Um, they're very short and you have to, there's no walkie talkies and no cell phones. So you have to kind of you assume that once you're, once the battle is joined, you're not going to be able to communicate with anyone else very effectively. So it's like as if you're planning a chess game, but you've got to do all your moves in advance. So he's got to sort of figure out not only what he thinks he should do, but what the other, uh, what his enemy is going to do and what he's going to do to counter that and give all those orders to the general and then boom, go in. And it's probably a pretty quick, um, fast, you know, Alexander comes in, wins usually, and um, the other guys flee. And then how was the army itself organized? I mean, Alexander commands a lot of loyalty from his men, but it's not, but it's not unequivocal loyalty. Um, he has to kind of convince them to keep going. He eventually is not able to convince them to keep going. Um, so what was the relationship like between Alexander, his generals, the troops? Like, how was the army itself kind of constituted? So the core of the army is Macedonian. And initially, at least, the command structure is very strongly Macedonian. Um, so the Macedonians have these, you know, the, the center of it is heavy armed infantry. And they have these huge spears called sarissas that are probably about 18 feet long. And they weigh something like 15 pounds. They're really heavy. But they made the army into something that was like a porcupine. And nobody could get anywhere close to them. And that is the weapon designed initially or created, as we think, by Alexander's father, Philip II, that is so decisive in their engagements against the Persians. And it's carried not only by the heavy armed infantry, but also by the cavalry, which is mind boggling. The cavalry is always a fair number of people, but way fewer than the infantry because you've got to feed all those horses um, and train them. But that's usually the, the strike force, the force that um, pushes into the other, other side. And they too have these 18 foot spears, which when you realize that they didn't have stirrups is mind boggling. Like how do they even just stay on their horses? It's crazy. So those are their two, those are the two major components. But then, as I said, he has all these other people. He has archers on horseback. He has archers on foot. He has guys who are light armed and throw javelins. He's got a lot of different, different parts of the army. The other thing to say is he has brilliant, brilliant um, generals, and he's an unusual leader, I think, in being seemingly really good at delegating, good at recognizing people who are good at what they're doing and who are loyal to him, and then giving them a lot of power and a lot of initiative. So very often, not just in his pursuit of Darius, but at a number of times, he leaves like half his army with somebody else. Uh, and that is partly practical. It's really hard to feed 30,000 men going through any particular place. So if you split them up, it works better, but it's also a chance for them to shine. And I think what's most striking about Alexander and his officers is the way that during his lifetime, they're these very smart, these very ambitious, these extremely competitive guys, uh, and he nonetheless manages to kind of ride herd over them during his lifetime and keep them all in line. And then, you know, you realize his accomplishment right after his death when they start fighting and they kind of split the empire in part and fight for the next, they and their descendants fight for the next 50 years. So it suggests something about the power of Alexander to command these people that he could keep them in line. Nobody else could. So... Alexander starts his campaign in India, which is it's like it's like this legendarily he gets to India and then is and then turns back. I, I have a hazy memory of seeing some 
social media post from Indian nationalists talking about how they were the ones that pushed <laughs> that beat Alexander. I've seen I think I've seen some 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 nationalist commentary on that front. But the point is he 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 gets to India. He manages to get to Punjab and then is turned back. So what actually happens during this this campaign? Yeah. India is different because it is largely not under direct Persian rule when Alexander comes in. Parts of it had been, and the Persian kings certainly boasted that they had conquered India and um, the palace of Persepolis, which shows people bringing tribute from all the parts of the empire, shows people from India lightly dressed, which must have been rather chilly in Persepolis. Um, and they fought, say, against the Greeks at uh, during the invasion um, of Greece by Persia 150 years earlier. But it's clear that whatever they had 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 rather frayed by the time Alexander gets there and that it was lightly held so that instead of having really strong governors, they had kind of a bunch of client kings who were nominally perhaps under Persian rule, but had a lot of independence. Alexander nonetheless wants to conquer India. I think partly he's eager to get to the full extent of what used to be the Persian empire, but I think he's also just fascinated by India as a place. He had heard all these crazy stories about it. You know, the rivers run with gold and there are people who have, you know, one foot and, uh, you know, two faces. I mean, they're like these really, the, the further you get from Greece, the wilder the stories are. And so there are all these crazy stories about it. But also he knows that there is a lot of, there are a lot of riches in India at the time of Herodotus, or at least when Herodotus is recording how much tribute different parts of the empire pay to the Persian kings, the tribute the Indians bring is worth about a third of the entire empire. So it's a lot of money, potentially. And in addition, there are jewels, there are spices. India is the source of pepper, for example, which is something that the Greeks and Macedonians are really interested in. So he knows that this is a really alluring part of um, the empire. And I think that's why he wants to conquer it. Um, and he go, but it's much harder because instead of going in as he did in much of the Western Persian empire, where you just sort of do a deal with somebody who commands a huge amount of territory, one of the governors, he's got to sort of deal with all these individual little client kings some of whom don't get along with each other very well. And then there are also these autonomous places where he seems to be dealing not so much with a king as with something like an oligarchy or democracy. And those are really intriguing and suggest that there was a lot of variety in the kinds of political systems in South Asia at the time, but that makes it much harder for him to kind of take power over all of it. And then he's eventually turned back. So, so what, what happens? Um, why is he eventually stop? So he gets beyond the Indus River, so which is the sort of center of present-day Pakistan. He gets further east, and he and his men have just fought a major battle against a powerful king in the Punjab named Porus. And... Alexander wins, but it's a terrifying battle because they're fighting elephants. And elephants, the Porus has a bunch of war elephants. That's a characteristic thing for a South Asian king of his time. But the Macedonians find them, you know, really horrific. The elephants trample people. They gore them to death with their tusks. They grab them with their trunks. I mean, it is not not fun. And these are, you know, these guys are not pussycats, but they're afraid of elephants. And so Alexander gets to this particular king and the king is like, oh, well, you know, um, yeah. So after, after my kingdom here, you get this 12 days of desert and then you're going to encounter this king who has like 3000 elephants. 
the poorest had maybe 200. And so Alexander's like, oh, wow, 3,000 elephants, that sounds great. But his men are not happy. And he finally, he calls an assembly. He's clearly kind of figured out that they're not super into this. But he wants to sort of try and coax them, as he often does, and bribe them in essence. And so he tells them the story. He's like, well, you know, now we're going to meet this, this wonderful, powerful king kingdom, and we're going to fight these 3000 elephants. And one of his most loyal subordinates, a guy named Koinos, gets up and says, you know, we just cannot go any further. We, we've hit our limit and we need to go home. Alexander is furious. He's clearly been operating on the assumption that they're just going to keep going. Uh, and he goes back very Achilles-like. He was thought he was descended from Achilles, and he certainly emulated him in all mm-hmm. kinds of ways. He sulks in his tent for three days. The army does not budge. And finally, he comes out. He calls his soothsayers together and they perform sacrifices and take, um, look for omens. And they tell Alexander, you know, we're really sorry, but the omens are not good. Really not good. And he goes, oh, okay. Guess we're going home. And with that, they turn back around. I just, as you were talking, I just had like a, a, a flash of a vision of like, say a Harvard business review article that talks about the management lessons of what to do and not to do of Alexander the great, how, how not to manage your team. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I think he's both in many ways, like has a lot of great leadership qualities, but this is not one of those times. Although I will say, and I would give him credit for this, you know, he backs down. And he does not try to fight it. And he listens to his men and he agrees to go back and he doesn't use any violence. And it's funny, I was writing this chapter in the summer of 2020 during the political protests in, um, you know, about George Floyd. And I remember thinking to myself, you know, people often call this a mutiny But it's clear that the soldiers never try to, you know, a mutiny usually implies that the soldiers are violent and they try to say kill or imprison the person they're mutinying against. They never do that. They thought this is really a lot like a political protest. And Alexander is treating it in a way that I think a good leader should treat a political protest, which is thoughtfully and seriously. He might not like what the answer is, but he realizes he's lost the mandate. And he backs down. So after this, Alexander spends some time trying to, I guess, knit his empire closer together to kind of um, stitch together the Greek bits and the Macedonian bits with the Persian bits. It's uh, not particularly popular among some elements of his of, of his like his base of support. But 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 how is Alexander trying to, I guess, create this? this multicultural empire and I guess to kind of put his empire on more stable cultural footing. What Alexander does that I think makes him impressive and, and relevant even today in terms of forging a multicultural state for people of very disparate um, languages, religions, cultural practices is that instead of, kind of imposing a structure that he thinks is natural from the top down, Mm -hmm. creating something ex novo, he really tries to work with the different places that he's conquering and to use elements from their cultural systems instead of dismantling them. And in fact, they're administrative systems. So in Egypt, he likely has himself crowned as pharaoh, and he keeps Mm -hmm. most of the Egyptian officials in place. And um, 
you know, leaves the way that they've been functioning as this incredibly powerful and effective empire for centuries, for millennia, um, leaves that in place. And in Persia too, and this I think is really one of the things that sets him apart and is so impressive, you know, the Persians had evolved a very strong administrative system over the past 200 years. And the usual read is that Alexander is able to conquer the Persian Empire because the Persian Empire is weak. But I don't think that's true. I think he uses this empire in this sort of brilliant kind of jiu-jitsu manner against itself. So he, you know, he co-ops the Persian king's subordinates. He empties his treasuries. He incorporates Persians, as we said, into his army, but also into his command structure by, um, I think there's a period from 330 to 327 BCE when he names 11 governors. There are about 20 in the Persian empire all told. 10 of them are Iranian. So mm-hmm. he's really using, using them um, to, because they know the system. And he's therefore able to kind of work within that system. And I think therefore what he's doing, if we step back a minute, is he's able to conquer the Persian Empire because the Persian Empire is strong. And he's able to use that strength against its king, but he's keeping it together. So... I was just reminded, you know, obviously this this empire, even though it doesn't last very long, and we'll talk about that in a second, but but the empire doesn't last very long, but yet it it has this great influence, I think, for for centuries um, afterwards. I, I remember an earlier podcast guest who was talking who was writing about the war between the Han Chinese and the Xiongnu, who is this other like steppe empire. Um, as part of that war, they go to this city state in Central Asia and they're all Greek or they're all Greek inspired. Um, and so and so what do you see is kind of like the 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 legacy of of Alexander of Alexander's empire as as short lived as it was? Well, Alexander himself, you know, dies and his empire fragments. But the people who. Mm-hmm continue to run it are Macedonian for three centuries. The last Macedonian empire doesn't end until the death of the great Cleopatra, uh, who's a descendant after all of Mm -hmm. one of Alexander's generals, Ptolemy. And that's in 31 BCE. So, well, she dies in 30, she's defeated in 31. So it's about three centuries. That's a long period. And, particularly in places where the conquest was hardest, that is particularly in Central Asia and Afghanistan, Alexander founds massive numbers of cities. And many of these are still important cities today, were for centuries from um, Kandahar in Southern Afghanistan to Begram, site recently of a US Air Force base. And these were probably not, you know, cities that had never existed before, but he staffs them with people who were Greek, uh, Greek and Macedonian. And so they become this sort of fascinating um, blended mix. So there's this wonderful city called Ikanum in what's now northern Afghanistan, which was likely someplace Alexander quickly passed through. And then it was create made into a larger and more impressive city by his general Seleucus, who ended up running most, much of the eastern part of Alexander's empire, it becomes a capital city um, in later times. And Iconum is crazy. It's got Chinese lacquerware. Uh, it's got Indian ivory. It's got Roman glass, it's got Greek bronzes all mixed in together. Um, And it's this place where one of the things the archaeologists, is one of the last digs before um, the Soviets came in, 
one of the things that the French archaeologists found was an inscription on one of the walls which has maxims of the Delphic Oracle. So you have to imagine all the way, it's almost like 3,000 miles from Greece, somebody is bringing these Delphic Oracle maxims. It's as though you are in Singapore and you see a billboard with um, the Declaration of Independence on it. So Mm -hmm. that's the kind of interconnected uh, world that Alexander is creating in this place. So maybe to end, I'd like to engage in some, in some, in some speculation, maybe, um, you know, it, like it, Alexander, I mean, Alexander, he dies of fever in 3D in 323 BC, I think around that point. Um, let's say this doesn't happen. You know, let's let, let, let's say he kind of survives this, this illness. Was his empire ever really sustainable? I mean, could he have, I, I mean, was would it have been possible for any one person to hold that disparate empire together, or was it just so big and so self contradictory that it was kind of destined to to fall apart? I don't think it was destined to fall apart. Alexander's mm. empire is essentially two million miles, two million square miles. Um, it's the Persian Empire plus Macedonia. Macedonia is about seventeen hundred square miles. It's a rounding error. The Mm -hmm. Persians had been holding this together for 200 years extremely well. Um, So it would not surprise me if Alexander, had he lived, you know, to 45, the age his father died at, or 60, or even 80, the age his generals, uh, Ptolemy and Seleucus, lived to, that he might have been able to forge it into enough of a cultural unity to hold it together. Um, He might have had client states in places like India uh, rather than direct rule, but so did the Persians. Um, So I don't see it as inherently unsustainable. And I guess it's also true. I, I was, I was thinking about this for interview and there is a model for an outside invader coming in, taking over an empire and, making it work it's like the mongols in china you know where the where the mongols came in invaded china and then like alexander tried to do with the persians adopted all the chinese traits and then and then made it work um so i guess yeah this 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 sort of thing has worked before or i guess worked after maybe to be more accurate yeah i mean the roman empire which is slightly smaller um but works in a very similar way like Mm. You have a light hand. It's not the administrative state we're used to. And yet it can um, encompass a very disparate group of people who see the benefits of the Pax Romana or um, I don't know what you would call it in the Mongols case, but, you know, see the benefits of being under, you know, one unified rule and, and it's enough to, to help it stay together. Um, but yeah, the Mongols are really the best, um, in a lot of ways, the best comp- comparanda. Alexander has the largest lifetime empire apart from that of Genghis Khan, hmm. who to be clear, lived twice as long. Yeah. Um, you know, maybe, may, maybe kind of one final question to, to close things off, you know, um, Alexander the Great is obviously, you know, extremely famous historical figure, um, seen as one of the the greatest generals in 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 history. So he's he is like he's he's this larger than life figure. But you know, over two thousand years later, what are the sorts of lessons that that we can draw from from Alexander's story? Like what what lessons are perhaps still important for us to remember today? So I think what, to me, made him most impressive as a leader are two things. One was his ability to recognize when a military solution was not going to work and to go with alternative solutions. Mm -hmm. So, for example, in Afghanistan, um, when he's stuck in this horrible guerrilla warfare, he finally decides the solution is not to try and 
you know, go for increasingly brutal tactics, it's to get married to the daughter mm-hmm. of one of the few warlords on his side. And that's what allows him to have the kind of ability to negotiate in good faith and put an end to the war. So it's partly that kind of um, recognition of the, the limits as well as what you can do with warfare. And the second thing which is connected to this is his ability to sort of get outside his own world view and <clears throat> appreciate the perspectives of the people he's conquering and what they bring to the table and what they, you know, what they care about and what matters to them. So, for example, there's this story of him and the queen mother of Persia, a woman named Sissy Gambus. He conquers her uh, or he captures her and her granddaughters, the Persian princesses. And one day he gets this wool from Macedonia and weavers. And he's so excited. And he sends them off to Sissy Gambus with this message that, you know, she likes this. The weavers can teach them how to make more. And from a Macedonian perspective, this is a great gift because every good Macedonian woman is supposed to be a weaver, Mm -hmm, Um, mm -hmm. even if you're a queen. But from the Persian perspective, this is super insulting. It's like, imagine if you're the queen and somebody's sending you a mop and telling you, I could teach you how to mop the floor. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is just totally demeaning. And so the messenger comes back and tells Alexandra, you know, she not only did she not like it, she had tears in her eyes. And Alexander, to his credit, goes to her and apologizes and says, you know, my clothes were made for me by my mother and sisters. And I think of this as a good thing, but I was misled by my own customs. So here we're watching him kind of adjust his worldview in real time, which is pretty impressive given the untrammeled political power that he has. Um, So I think this is both a story about like the the challenges he faces, but also about how important it is to be able to admit that you're wrong and mm-hmm. get outside what you think of as customary and natural. So I think that's a great place to end our interview with Rachel Kauser, author of Alexander at the End of the World, The Forgotten Final Years of Alexander the Great. Rachel, I actually have two final questions for you, which are, uh, where can people find your work? Not not just this book, but all of your work. And what's next for you? What do you think the next project might be? Thank you. I You can go to my website, rachelkauser.com, and find information about all my work there. Uh, I'm also on Instagram at rkauser. And in terms of what's next, I'm thinking about a book about feasting and a sort of history of the ancient Mediterranean diet in four feasts. I got interested in feasts because it seems sometimes to me like Alexander, everything that was important to him happened at a feast. But I became fascinated by the foodways of the ancient Mediterranean, and it seems like a fun next project. Certainly seems like a fun way to look at that, to look at that history. Yeah, it's a very different way of telling history. After after a military history book, I was like, I think I'm ready for something about something a little less, less intense. So you can follow me, Nicholas Gordon, on Twitter at Nick R. I. Gordon. That's N-I-C-K-R-I-G-O-R-D-O-N. You can go to AsianReviewBooks.com to find other reviews, essays, interviews, and excerpts. Follow them on Twitter at Book Reviews Asia. That's Reviews Plural. And you can find many more author interviews at the New Books Network and NewBooksNetwork.com. We're on all your favorite podcast apps, Apple Podcasts, Spotify. Rate us, recommend us, share us with your friends to support us interviewing those running in, around, and about Asia. Stay tuned for more news and who's coming up on the show. But before then, Rachel, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thanks. It was a real pleasure. 